From Chicago, welcome to Three Degrees Discussions. I'm your host, Mike Vasquez. This is a podcast devoted to the stories behind the innovators, entrepreneurs, and leaders in the 3D printing industry. For a really good example I can point to is um, when we talk about, say, reconditioning of used powder as a part of the process to remove oversized particles. And commonly that's done via sieving. And somebody had the feedback that said, well, I can't sieve with the same mesh size that is the upper bound on the powder size range that I'm currently using because that sieve will blind and it'll take forever to do. Especially when I have potentially hundreds if not thousands of pounds of powder to sieve, I need to have a way to, to really capture the boulders and not try and reproduce the upper limit again that I had to start with. And so, we have draft language right now that says, well, you can use the next larger size mesh that is standard in the ASTM document just defining the mesh sizes. But now we have to define very specific language as to what the new tolerance is on percent weight that comes out the other end. And so we've had to then effectively survey the people on the call of what, what actually makes sense here. Is this, we don't want to use the same tolerance language we had before because it doesn't, we don't want to have the PSD range growing and now you're qualified processes using an entirely different feedstock because the PSD range has changed. But at the same time, we have to be we have to be mindful that people are doing this with the intent of just catching the the, the stuff that is going to interfere with the process downstream. So these what we call boulders. And so we're settling on numbers that maybe we don't have the best data, but we have the the best collective sense that is going to inform that decision and it's kind of a guardrail. That was Tyler LeBrun. Tyler is an independent additive manufacturing consultant at Protingent. Prior to his current role, he spent several years in the aerospace sector at both Blue Origin and Aerojet Rocketdyne. Tyler is actively engaged in industry volunteerism with drafting and reviewing standards pertaining to all aspects of additive manufacturing. He's a committee member of ASTM and ISO. He's also a regular contributor to SAE Aerospace Material Specifications, including authoring and leading working groups on draft specifications that have general committee review and ballot. We take a deep dive today on standards and additive manufacturing. All right, Tyler, welcome to the show. Thanks for being with us. Why don't we just start with how you got into the additive manufacturing space? Sure thing. Um, first, thank you for having me on, on the show. It's a, it's a pleasure to talk about myself and my background and um, what, how does that all fit with additive manufacturing. Um, but so my background, I was introduced to additive manufacturing probably back in 2000 and, 2007, 2008 timeframe. Um, I was a design engineer for the J2X program working for, at the time, Brett Whitney Rocketdyne. Now it's Aerojet Rocketdyne. And the J2X engine was supposed to be an upper stage uh, engine for the Ares uh, launch vehicle, um, what's now known as the Space Launch System, and that's dovetailing with the Artemis program. Um, and I worked on a very small piece of hardware as part of an engine systems design team, and that particular piece of hardware became one of the leading technical problems for the engine program, having to deal with a variety of manufacturing challenges as well as combustion instabilities for that particular engine. And as a parallel path, our team explored additive manufacturing to try and produce a single piece of ducting that also served as a combustion chamber for the gas generator on that engine cycle. And um, that effectively has been the uh, case study that NASA, specifically Marshall Space Flight Center, has pointed to um, as their introduction to additive manufacturing. And um, roughly since like the 2008, 2009 timeframe, they've seen a tremendous expansion in terms of the amount of resources and time and um, headcount, both internally to the organization and by other um, partners in the space uh, to leverage AM as a manufacturing technology as well as a materials processing technology. So that was my initial introduction and that kind of further spun into um, some other work when Right when Rocketdyne was looking at trying to leverage the technology to replicate older hardware from engine programs long past to see what it would take to bring new products to the market. And then from there, I, I jumped headfirst into a PhD program um, in Japan and was able to leverage uh, my exposure in the aerospace industry, coupled with the lab's expertise in um, strain rate sensitivity, mechanical testing of materials to uh, start looking at how does AM as a process affect mechanical properties. 
And so that's, that became the academic spin that I um, spent a lot of time working on over three and a half years in Japan and then came back and jumped um, into Blue Origin for uh, few, uh, several years and worked as part of the MMP team for two of those years and um, was, instru- was working very hard on um, developing the process, developing the materials, trying to um, deploy those new processes and materials into the product space that we were working on for the different propulsion uh, programs at Blue Origin. And then from there, I transferred to work at a startup company in the Bay Area called Uniformity Labs, where I was working on both materials and processes, more on the feedstock side of the process flow, but uh, was developing uh, IP and showing how to map that IP onto existing additive manufacturing platforms. Um, But in the last, I'd say, a few months, I've kind of transitioned more into a consultancy type uh, posture and am now working with a couple of different clients on helping to qualify and stand up out of the manufacturing uh, tools and processes um, in the aerospace industry and others. And so it's, uh, it's, it's been quite a diverse path that's meandered here and there on both sides of the Pacific. And um, what's great is it's always changing. So I've always had uh, exposure to a variety of different challenges and, and uh, ways to see the technology grow and mature with time. So we were talking a little bit before I press record about kind of what a good topic area would be. And I think we settled on, on standards, which for now is, uh, I think will continue to be, and currently is a, a very hot topic in, in the space. And I thought when we start our discussion on that kind of, who are the main players when we're thinking about 3D printing, the added manufacturing space in standards. I mean, you've got ISO and ASTM, but like where, if you're kind of starting as an end user and looking at the standards landscape, what what bodies do you think are most relevant? Yeah, the, the standards uh, landscape is very diverse. And um, what's interesting is that depending on what industry you're working in, uh, you're really then kind of looking to either one or maybe two different organizations or what we refer to, what we refer to as SDO, standards defi- defining organizations. And um, some, some bodies are trying to be um, the jack of all trades when it comes to defining the different documents and standards that govern additive manufacturing. And specifically, I'm, I'm kind of uh, looking to ISO and ASTM and their joint documents that they release. And on occasion, they'll have their own standalone documents. But ISO ASTM is broken down into a variety of different subcommittees that have um, either very specific scope, either in design or materials and process, environmental health and safety, or even in industry specific uh, categories. So you have space and aviation, you have the oil and gas industry, you have maritime, you have automotive. And so these are all separate categories where they're each trying to write documents that are tailored to those particular industries. Uh, so that's, that's ISO and ASTM. They're um, they're working very hard at trying to cover as much ground as possible, as quickly as possible, since we're kind of playing catch up to this particular uh, technology. Um, the other types of SDOs that are out there, the one that I've spent a lot of time with is the Society for Automotive Engineers, uh, SAE, specifically on the aerospace material standards, or I'm sorry, aerospace material specifications uh, committees for both uh, metals and non-metallics. Um, I, that one has been specifically targeted, obviously, for aerospace applications. And um, I've spent a lot of time in there just because of my exposure to um, Rattony Rocketdyne and Blue Origin. Um, but that audience is principally concerned with, say, commercial aviation, military aviation. Um, you've also got um, missile and defense, um, rocket propulsion. So it's a much smaller, narrower field of uh, end users, but you also then see kind of the trickle down effect if anybody refers to say MMPDS or the other types of um, big library books that have the mechanical properties that people will refer to when designing their parts, if, even if it's outside of the aerospace industry. The data that feeds into those types of documents comes from a lot of the work that SAE has done. And MMPDS is, a, is another organization that's not somebody you would think of as a a standards uh, defining organization, but they are creating um, what is effectively the Bible on um, mechanical properties for more traditional material forming technology. And then you've also got now the um, intensive engineering intensive applications. I think that's how they're defining volume two, which includes additive manufacturing. But beyond that, um, 
So there's another group called America Makes that's um, helping to kind of bridge the gap between the private and, part, uh, private and public space when it comes to spearheading some of the um, technical development of these types of technologies. And that includes helping to understand the landscape of, of standards. And so they put out a great document in 2017 with ANSI uh, describing the, the landscape of who's who in the standards world. But um, I think between the ones I've already mentioned, those are the, the heavy hitters when it comes to what people think of when looking for standards for this type of technology currently. And so you've been on kind of both sides of the both kind of thinking about standard development as well as an, an end user. I mean, how would you react to this? So kind of my perspective now is by no means will the standards catch up or should they probably catch up to kind of the current cutting edge of additive manufacturing. And so kind of with that underlying hypothesis, you would, I kind of take the approach that the standards that are written now um, can be applied almost as a best practice or kind of here's a starting point for Kind of new applications, new industries, new technologies that are coming down the pike. So rather than a prescriptive document necessarily, they're really good reference sources for how to approach thinking about qualifying a material or qualifying a piece of equipment. Right. Um, so I would say that uh, that assessment in terms of where do the standards come in terms of the timeline for a particular technology. Usually it is typically sweeping up behind the bleeding edge. And um, as it probably should, since it's a laboratory environment with a low technology readiness level of, of any one particular um, form of additive manufacturing that um, doesn't yet exist on paper for a standard. Um, but there are, there are places that we're trying really hard to try and stay ahead of that curve. Um, a really good example I can probably point to would be um, like binder jetting, for example. We've seen binder jetting as a technology, but we haven't seen binder jetting in some of the spaces that I think some documents currently are being uh, written to try and come to market at the same time as the actual technology and product itself. So we're working very closely with machine OEMs to make sure that uh, these documents help to uh, properly frame the materials and technology to aid in the adoption of the technology going forward at the same time. But things like powder bed fusion that's had a lot more time in terms of maturation, um, it, the standards kind of play a uh, I, almost like a herding of cats since everybody has already had a chance to play with the technology and develop their own processes and methods. And now you're trying to have everybody kind of march to the beat of the same drum. That's where the standards kind of show up. So as everybody knows what to expect from everybody else and work to the same set of, not rules, but uh, guidance type of language to create quality parts at the other end. And in industries where that's really important, such as like the medical space and then in aerospace, uh, quality is of utmost importance. And so having everybody working to the same set of instructions is really important uh, while still giving freedom for their application and their end use. Um, but the standards play a role then in just helping to uh, either settle confusion or establish similar types of uh, work instructions or uh, help to establish some sort of baseline for mechanical properties based off of, um, I wouldn't want to say lowest common denominator uh, operational characteristics of the technology, but certainly how do you um, ensure you have quality feedstock going in, you have quality material coming out, what are the minimum characteristics that define that quality material? And then from that, based off of the type of technology we're talking about, either uh, selective laser melting with full, full densification of the material and a known chemistry of your feedstock going in, you should be able to come out the other end with a baseline set of properties that uh, you can then work from further with either subsequent post-processing or heat treatment or what other other types of steps you deem necessary for your end use application. But it helps to just kind of clear the confusion and that's where a lot of people currently are. They don't know what is either possible or what should be expected of a particular product or process. And that's where the standards really help to set that guidance and framework. Um, and then in case of the cases of quality, they really help to put the rules in place so everybody's kind of playing the same game the same way. And in your experience, how long is the process for developing some of these standards? That's an excellent question. Um, it really depends. Um, it depends on what we're talking about in terms of what the scope and purpose of the document is supposed to be. 
how many different stakeholders there are and um, potentially how quickly that process or technology or material is evolving. And so what I could, I guess, speak to is, let's say if we're looking at just a, a powder feedstock specification for either direct energy dep deposition or laser powder bed fusion uh, applications, the chemistry is pretty well established. And so you then kind of step into the weeds a little bit and look at some of the more specific characteristics to the how that powder gets used. But those types of uh, idiosyncrasies get ironed up pretty quick. There aren't usually that many things that people disagree on when it comes to a material specification. When you get into, say, a process specification defining uh, key process variables or uh, standard practice for how that process should run, um, what types of things have to be documented and the roles and, re and responsibilities associated with either a parts producer or a cognizant engineering organization, what have you, um, then it becomes a lot more complicated. And then there's a lot more back and forth between everyone from machine OEMs to end users to feedstock suppliers to regulatory bodies. Um, it then can take anywhere on a powder feedstock, maybe about a, a year to 18 months from the start of a document to its final release to a process document. We're talking on the order of a couple years or longer to put something on paper from a working group level out to ballot for review by the by a particular committee and then subsequent uh, revision cycles of the document, additional balloting cycles until finally you have uh, ultimately something that everybody can agree upon and then release and publication. And then by that time, you're already wondering, do I need to start a revision cycle because something has changed or we didn't properly word something that captures the intent here best. Um, when you where that timeline gets really extended is when you have uh, problems like you're trying really hard. In the case of like ASTM ISO, um, they want to put out joint documents. And I understand the, the desire to have that kind of um, collaborative environment set up that way. But then now you have to have not only everything that I've just described, but you have to have the, the meshing of two different entirely separate organizations in their schedules and their review cycles that are independent of each other. Um, and sometimes those timelines don't sync up or a particular ballot has comes back with negative comments that require some sort of evaluation and um, potentially some sort of um, further meetings and discussion or even a vote by a committee to either establish the persuasiveness of the, the negative comment. But that can throw a wrench in the whole timeline. And if you miss one other organization's gating act activity and their schedule that they've established, it may force a whole new set of uh, restart to that review cycle. And sometimes with ISO, that can be on the order of a year, two years, or even more. And so these documents really get set way into the future in terms of their expected release date. Um, and so that's why it's, it's important to get as many people on board as early as possible so that you don't have that possible churn cycle that can drag things out. And I've had the pleasure of sitting in on a few standards meetings and even been on, on some working groups. But for those who have not been involved in that process. Can you describe a little bit more of kind of what does that typically look like? Presumably sure. there's, there's, there's some, a lot of different voices in that conversation. Oh, absolutely. Um, the SDOs try really hard to have a balanced representation of both machine OEMs, end users, uh, feedstock suppliers or producers, um, and then to ensure that the regulatory bodies have a voice at the table as well, because ultimately those are the folks that have to uh, ensure that the implementation of the document is done correctly for whatever industry we care about. So you have all these different stakeholders. And these SDOs then will have um, typically some need will arise within the industry and identify we, somebody out here is asking for a particular standard to cover, say, um, in the case that I could speak to very intimately, um, the recycling of metal feedstock for, metal powder feedstock for um, powder-based technologies. So we're talking laser powder bed fusion specifically is the one that comes to mind, but I'm currently the document sponsor on that one. And so what we've done is we've proposed a document, the committee then, uh, committee leadership then will evaluate whether or not there is a, in fact a need for this document and approve the project. And once that project is approved, it's on me as the document sponsor to solicit uh, participation from the committee or the industry at large, even from people that are not on the committee, if I know the right contacts to to bring into the conversation. So at which point I then am now running every week for an hour on say Wednesday in the afternoon, I've got a, a working group meeting that we just march through draft language that I'm proposing 
or others will end up writing and submitting to me so that I can kind of collect everything together and have us on the call on a, on a WebEx call, for example, to just um, march through the document as it currently is drafted and get feedback from all the people on the call, make changes, have everybody review it again, and just this cycle every week or sometimes every other week just goes through for months, even more than a year at a time. And so finally a draft is formed that we feel this is going to be good enough uh, it's not it's not perfect, but it's good enough to submit to the committee for ballot. And so then that document then gets put out for a formal initial ballot, at which point everybody that is on whatever committee we're talking about will get an electronic notification saying, hey, you have a new ballot to review. Here's the document draft to, to look at. Uh, please either approve, um, approve with comment, uh, negative with comment, or abstain. And one of those four choices and people on the committee that have voting rights will then be expected as part of the responsibility to maintain voting right participation is to actually provide feedback in one form or the other, approval or uh, negative with comment. And so those are typically on the order of about a month, usually is how long those uh, full ballot cycles will go. And then at the end of about 28 days, four weeks, those comments will be collected by the, the document sponsor. And then all of those will then have to be addressed by the working group. And if any of the negative comments um, come back and they are usually very good and very astute comments as to, oh, this particular section needs more clarification or these things are not uh, consistent or you're missing these technical requirements that we think you should have for this process. That all then gets rolled up into a revised version and then at which point, uh, if there are any comments that we disagree with as a working group, those will get elevated to the committee level and then we'll have a greater discussion before finally a, a new draft is then resubmitted for another ballot cycle. And then you keep whittling it down until finally you've got something that has uh, fewer than, um, at least on SAE, for example, you'll have fewer than five uh, technical changes coming out of the, the ballot process, at which point you can then do a limited scope ballot if, you, if it's prudent to do so. And then at which point you're not reviewing the whole document again, you're only reviewing the subsections that you really care about. And then after it's gone through and you've been able to clear some sort of final affirmation ballot where everybody is now agreeing to the language of the document. Um, and those are typically shortened by about to two weeks instead of the full four. Uh, you then have something that's approved by the committee. It then goes to the Aerospace Council, which is a different body that will review the document for consistency as to the, the rigor that that particular SDO expects of their documents. And then at which point it usually will be approved. Um, and then it'll be made available for uh, purchase and download by whatever STO we're talking about, either ASTM, or SAE, or MPIF, or what other body that is doing that uh, document process. And all the while, you'll have just this ongoing conversation throughout the balloting uh, process and the working group meetings. You'll have typically meetings with the larger committee to elevate issues or to solicit for feedback that's outside of your working group. Um, it's, just, it's an ongoing collaborative discussion to create something that is going to make the most users happy uh, at the end of the day. Um, but we know fully well that's not always possible. So it's sometimes these very contentious documents can take years to finally get out. Or you publish what's good enough and you come back with a re revision cycle after the fact and someone else will pick up that re revised document as a document sponsor and start the whole process all over again. So you get my interest and curiosity peaked a little bit with the conversation of metal powder recycling. So can you give us a, any previews of, kind of the, <laughs> the, the, at least maybe not specific to what the standard says, but kind of what, what are you looking in that? That's a big topic. I mean, oh. There's a whole lot of machine specific issues. There's material specific oh, yes. issues there. Um, so I, I will say that I, maybe there's a tiny part of me that regrets volunteering to do this document, <laughs> but um, the, the challenge we identified with um, the AMS Metals Committee is that some of the process standards had language that said, you must, you must generate a powder reuse and recycling plan. Uh, so the process document that defines laser powder bed fusion process has a subsection in there that just says that. And there is no other guidance. It doesn't tell you what to do. It doesn't tell you what's important to keep track of. It doesn't tell you um, what do you have to collect for data. Nothing, no other information. They recognize at the time that those documents were released that they didn't have either the bandwidth to, to write that document or enough technical expertise in the industry to do something like that. So as we come, kind of jokingly say, it's been punted to the future and that'll be future committee's problems. Um, 
but now that future is now trying to collect that um, that bill. And so I volunteered to take that on. And what we're discovering very quickly is that there are a lot of people that say that they recycle powder. And for powder bed fusion processes, it's almost expected that people are not only consuming new virgin material and then discarding what's used and not recycling it. So we know that this is the status quo for the industry, for many industries, in fact. So now we have to try and figure out how do we properly define and capture what is the most common standard practice, but for an, air, for an industry such as the aerospace industry that requires, in many cases, the highest level of quality, how do you then ensure that the powder you're recycling is going to be of sufficient quality to meet the downstream material properties you would expect of the process? And the powder specifications that were originally released for powder bed fusion were written more as a procurement tool, but now they're being used as a way to uh, generate acceptance criteria for recycled powder. So now we're finding where those gaps are in the way the link, in the way that those documents were written, and the way that they're now we're trying to bootstrap them onto a recycling process. So not only do you have issues with acceptance criteria. So what is acceptable from a recycled powder standpoint that maybe is not acceptable for new virgin material at procurement? That's a question that's not fully well answered yet. Um, how do you handle recycling on closed loop systems? Um, do we believe that a closed loop system is going to be um, provide enough opportunity for you to inspect and measure and sample to validate and substantiate that the process is working correctly? Um, so a lot of machines that are on the market now have integrated sieving and recycling systems that are built in. Is this document going to somehow take that into account and capture that? Um, that's something that we're still working on. How do we properly define the different forms of recycling that are out there? So if you only have one machine and you're a single machine service bureau and you're working with a single lot of powder, someone could easily imagine taking powder, putting it in your machine and running through and then consuming that lot of powder and only topping off what you've consumed to replenish your supply. And that maybe your, your only recycling activity is sieving for oversized particles. That may be the extent of what you think of recycling. But in a case where you have maybe a dozen or so printers of the same model and you're printing perhaps the same build file on all these printers, can you then collect all these different in-process lots of material quarantine them until your entire starting lot has been completed, completely exhausted. And then as a batch, using the economies of scale that you've now amassed all this used powder, process it all in one go. And now you started off with a newly uh, certified set of powder um, and start the whole process over again. But so you have machines that are in parallel, you have a single machine, you have all these different combinations of how someone could define recycling. And so we started off on this document trying to define common language. So things like what's the difference between blending and mixing? Apparently there is one. Uh, what is the difference between the three main steps of the recycling process? The recovery, the reconditioning, and the mixing or blending. So we've tried to properly categorize and, and provide language that helps to describe each of those discrete steps. Um, so all of this front end work that we've done is we're now kind of marching through the requirements and quality sections of the document, fully well knowing that somebody for sure is gonna come up with an example that we haven't fully captured. And so further still, we know that we could provide very sometimes obtuse looking language that describes the requirement, requirement type language, but it doesn't give you any kind of information as to how to actually implement it. So we're planning on having a fairly heavy notes section in this document that's going to provide uh, more guidance language that says, well, if you're really going to be handling, say, a stainless steel powder, and you've been able to, you know that it's, your oxygen pickup rate, it's pretty minimal. It's already, um, it's not a reactive material such as like titanium or uh, say aluminum, um, where you're going to be picking up oxygen a lot faster. Um, perhaps you don't have to do the sampling and testing with every single uh, build cycle, but you need to be able to show that you're able to control your process and predict when that's going to happen, that you're going to no longer meet your chemistry requirements. So here's how you might go about doing that, how you can set up and substantiate a reduced sampling and testing schedule to lower the burden of cost of testing and, and the schedule hit that would come from it. 
this document's trying to do all of that. And it's, it's proving to be very challenging because um, we're very late to the game with this particular document. And people have already set up the recycling processes and have customers already building parts to those processes and with that material. And so now we're, we're trying not to box people out by that language. And so it's, it's very challenging to keep as many stakeholders happy as possible. And these, this particular working group has typically a, an attendance that exceeds 20 people on the call. And so most people are kind of sitting back and listening just to kind of understand and have eyes on, on the, the project as it moves forward. But there are a lot of voices on the call as well. And so it's having all that feedback, but then having clear discontinuity between, well, one person does this and someone else does that. It's, it's not easy to make everybody happy. I imagine that uh, can be some very fruitful conversations <laughs> or uh, when you get down to the, the nitty gritty. Because I mean, even something like if you're talking about blending, mixing, but sampling and how you test a particular material, whether it just take something seemingly simple like particle size distribution, right? Right. The, the methodology of doing that, where you sample it, how often do you sample it, when is it sampled, and how you're reading the the actual output and even the machines have variability within them themselves. So trying to distill all that into something that at the end of the day is hopefully going to enable rather than um, put a huge roadblock into the, the use and uptake of the technology is I imagine. That's right. Challenging. That's, it's, that's exactly right. The, the hardest part is trying to, trying to at the same time, keep, people that have to do the work uh, happy in terms of this is, this is the burden of work that they would be expected to do if they're conforming to the document. But at the same time, provide enough information and enough uh, repeatable uh, robustness to the process that a regulatory body such as the FAA would be needing to see in parts that show up in a say, commercial aviation product. And so there's a lot of, we're trying real hard to find either ways to compromise or ways to give people off ramps if they can leverage data in ways that don't increase the cost of and burden on the process in general. So there's a lot of people out there that have done this work already. And we know that people have created their own internal data that is helping to guide them in their implementation of additive manufacturing tools and processes. And so if they can do that and they can demonstrate to a regulatory body that they don't have to check every time, check exhaustively everything from bulk reactive, bulk non-reactive, sur surface reactive elements, PSD, flowability, tap density, apparent density, you name it. If they can show with data that they've done that homework already, they don't have to keep doing it and just add cost onto their parts and processes. And how do you manage the communication aspect of the the standard itself? I mean, you're in a room, presumably, kind of on Zoom calls these days with subject matter experts that have lived and breathed additive manufacturing for decades, potentially. And these standards are written in in a way that hopefully should be accessible to everyone. And even someone new coming into the space, starting a facility, you're starting a an application, is there any challenges there in, in communicating what level of detail that you need? Well, so that's, that's a very good question. Um, there are things that we've identified to be specific requirements that we don't want to have any wickle room on interpretation. And so those, that type of language is, is very direct. Um, for a really good example that I can point to is um, when we talk about say, reconditioning of used powder as a part of the process to remove oversized particles. And commonly that's done via sieving. And somebody had the feedback that said, well, I can't sieve with the same mesh size that is the upper bound on the powder size range that I'm currently using because that sieve will blind and it'll take forever to do. Especially when I have potentially hundreds, if not thousands of pounds of powder to sieve, I need to have a way to, to really capture the boulders and not try and reproduce the upper limit again that I had to start with. And so we have draft language right now that says, well, you can use the next larger size mesh that is standard in the ASTM document just defining the mesh sizes. But now we have to define very specific languages to what the new tolerance is on 
percent weight that comes out the other end. And so we've had to then effectively survey the, the people on the call that what, what actually makes sense here is this, we don't want to use the same tolerance language we had before because it doesn't, we don't want to have the PST range growing and now your qualified process is using an entirely different feedstock because the PSD range has changed. But at the same time, we have to be, we have to be mindful that people are doing this with the intent of just catching the, the, the stuff that is going to interfere with the process downstream. So these what we call boulders. And so we're settling on numbers that maybe we don't have the best data, but we have the, the best collective sense that is going to inform that decision. And it's kind of a guardrail. But in those cases, it's very specific language. In other cases, we talk very vaguely. We talk about um, you need to have a contamination control plan to ensure that you don't have pick up a foreign material. And we don't necessarily say what that is. We don't say you have to avoid um, either like hairs and fibers from whatever type of clothing the person's wearing. So we don't have that kind of language, but we then at the very end of the process, we have checks to ensure the powder is still quality. So we have ensuring that the powder meets the chemistry requirements for bulk reactive and bulk non-reactive elements. And that is a way to qualify your process and ensure that your contamination control plan is properly impl implemented, which also then speaks to the fact that you've made sure you don't have cross-contamination from another powder source. If you had processed aluminum and then you then decided you wanted to process ink in L718, you're in the same equipment, you're setting yourself up for a lot of danger with respect to material contamination. But those checks help to go back and make sure. So we try to think in advance and think ahead of what types of problems may arise from the vagueness of particular sections of the document. But at the same time, we don't want to be so restrictive and so um, limiting that we are effectively having to have everybody do exactly the same thing every single time because then nobody's going to use the document. We have to give people wiggle room to come to the finish line and create the quality material that is ultimately the reflection of their process. We don't really care so much as to the path dependency of the process as much, as long as it's documented and well-controlled and repeatable. What we do care about is quality material in the final part that meets expected and predictable properties that you know you can make basically every time. So how you get there is more up to the implementation and agreement between the parts producer and the what we call the cognizant engineering organization, whoever is ultimately the customer of that particular part or process. So there's there's a lot of room for interpretation and implementation in some places, but in other places we're like, no, 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 this is very specific language because it's the technical requirement. Right, and you mentioned before this idea of, kind of the closed versus open loop systems, and now as machines evolve and, and change to bigger platforms and more, it, integrated powder handling, both from a, a safety perspective and perhaps also from a repeatability and just ease of use perspective. How much do the OEMs and equipment manufacturers have to say on some of these standards? Are, are they integrated into these conversations? Are they thinking about kind of problems that you're facing? Presumably they hear kind of questions from their customers. Okay, if we're, we want to use your technology or buy your machine, how do we qualify it? And right. so are, are they integrated in that conversation too? Uh, machine OEMs are frequently involved. Um, not all machine OEMs are at the table. That, but that's not by exclusion. That's just sometimes just a matter of bandwidth or it's not uncommon for somebody to receive the standard as it's written and then say, well, we comply to this document in everywhere except these particular sections. And then they'll have rationales to why or here's alternative things that we can sign up to. But the machine OEMs, by, by and large, for many of them are participating um, in the conversations of how these documents get written. Some are probably less, some documents are less relevant. So um, if, say, a machine OEM is a full integrated service provider or solutions provider, and they have both their own powders, their own machines, and their own mechanical properties with these own their own tailored heat treatments, so if they bookend from the start to the finish, they'll probably have something to say on everything from the powder specification, the process specification, and the material property specification. They'll have input somewhere along that entire uh, value stream. Uh, some are less involved in that case, and they'll probably only speak up when it comes to something that either they, they are being asked to provide information that they don't want to provide. So if there's some sort of proprietary nature of their process or um, how they run their machine in particular or some 
something that is considered their IP, they're not going to want to have that be required to be uh, divulged to a, a, an end user or a potential customer. And so we have ways to kind of work around those limitations. And so having that dialogue is, is valuable and important from the standards perspective, um, but we, their participation is, is pretty consistent from a lot of the big names that are out there in the industry right now. For those listening who are curious about the process of getting involved on some of these working group committees and um, helping to write some of these standards or be reviewers, what's that typical process like? Um, so it, it's different for every single body, but they all kind of follow the same flow chart. Um, for say like a, ASTM and SAE, the participation on the committees is done at the individual level and you can effectively join the, the working groups without necessarily having to be a member of the agency. I, I believe that is the case for, for both the ones that I quoted there. Um, but it facilitates um, quite a lot more if you're able to actually join up as a membership and individual memberships are uh, fairly affordable for just the, the single person. But you also have at the, so like for example, ANSI has more organizational level mem memberships. Uh, it's difficult to get onto some of the bodies such as like the ISO because you have to be referred by your nation's membership agency. So in this case, in the context of additive manufacturing, you have to be referred on by the ASTM body as to be a subject matter expert for the relevant ISO working group. That's because those types of committees tend to overlap, your voice is sometimes already heard if you're voting on the ASTM equivalent or shared document. And so, the path is typically um, reaching out to the committee leadership once you've joined these agencies and then they'll quickly tie you into whatever the, the meeting schedule is. Um, they'll get you set up with whatever uh, on the working roster. And if you have a particular area that you are an expert in or have a lot of experience working with, um, they'll probably point you to whatever working groups or subcommittees have that as their scope of uh, and domain to get you involved more directly. Um, Typically, it takes time of participation at kind of what we refer to as like a liaison level or a general interest or some other level where you're able to provide comments on ballots, but you're not a voting member yet. Usually, you have to show participation for an extended period of time um, with comments on ballots, participation in meetings, face-to-face -face meetings when they ever happen again, but face-to-face -face meetings that happen every six months or so. That continued participation gets you uh, elevated to a place of visibility that you you could be allowed to be a voting member on those those committees and um, it's expected that you'll continue to pr provide input and participation to to maintain that voting status and that's where you get to review everything and be a part of the uh, of the team in a more intimate way but it's typically it starts with the reaching out to the leadership and that kind of information is fairly well publicized online as far as I understand um, but it's there's typically these well-worded pages like, how do I get involved? And so they have that information pretty accessible. Right. And switching gears a little bit, one of the things that I've really enjoyed following on your LinkedIn, I don't know if it's posted elsewhere, is your kind of manuscript review and paper review. How did that get started? Um, I really wanted to take the, the lens of what I had been looking at additive for years when I was in school and continue to both keep my eyes open to how the technology and landscape is changing at the academic level, but also from the perspective of somebody in the industry. And so being exposed to the, the journal writing process, I knew that that's where a lot of really, really rich, and informa rich information was coming out. And so being able to take that, read the papers, digest them into a fairly accessible and character limited format that LinkedIn does, and then basically broadcast that on a on a regular basis provides um, an opportunity for other people that maybe either don't know or don't have the time or don't have the interest to read a whole paper and just want to see, well, what is my particular take on what's changing in, in the academic landscape that could have implement implementations in the industry? Um, that's something that I thought I could generate value outside of just the immediate work that I was doing on standards or immediate work I was doing in my own uh, organization for work. Um, but this was just something more of a, a public uh, action that I thought I could do that was um, both fun and exciting at the same time. Well, I've really enjoyed it. I love keeping, I mean, it's hard for 
people to keep up track of all the different papers coming out and the fact that you kind of do that hard work and, and put it out there for everyone to see is, is really much appreciated on my end. There, there's a lot more that's always published that I never have the time or the bandwidth to be able to digest, but um, it's, it's a, a handful of like Google Scholar alerts that help to just fire hose the information. I mean, then I have to sift sort and figure out, okay, well, this one actually looks like it's something that I can speak intelligently about and distill down to a level that is relevant for people. Um, but it's, it's a lot of fun because it keeps my skills sharp too. That's probably one of the other things that's really kept me involved with that is just, I don't want to let go of knowing that there's this technology is always changing. There's always something new and having the opportunity to uh, share that and broadcast that is something that I've really enjoyed doing over the last uh, several weeks. For sure. And for all those listeners who are interested, it's most mainly posted to your LinkedIn. Are there other places where that, that lives? Uh, I'm trying really hard to get that uh, just out of um, a habit to post it as well to Twitter. Um, there's a different limitation in terms of character count, but um, that I think there's a way I can just make that a simultaneous post at the same time from both out of LinkedIn and it pushes to Twitter, but that's the other place that I would be putting it at. Um, but typical social media platforms. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate the conversation today. I found it very useful and um, I learned a ton about the standards process. So if people are interested in kind of following the work you're doing on the, the standards, um, they certainly can get in touch and, and certainly on the papers that you're putting out. But anything else we should point them to in terms of things you're up to and, and what you're involved in? Um, the standards world, I think this is just the one plug I'll make. Uh, the standards world always could use more participation because it's it, things get released and then we find out that we either didn't fully understand or have the right voices at the table. So if there's anybody listening that is interested in participating, we always welcome both at a, in ASTM and SAE and MPIF and every other body that's out there that's handling their respective industries. Um, they always could use the, the greater participation. It's always a challenge when there's no one available to pick up the work that we know the industry really, really desperately needs. And so having more people that are willing to put the time and energy in is something I think that uh, the industry will benefit as a whole from. So we always welcome more participation. and always would like to work with other people in the industry as well and outside of our, our home organizations that we, we report to every day. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for your time today, Tyler. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. It's, it's been a pleasure.